Can we bow our heads again just for a moment before we go into the Word of God? Our Father, now I pray that you would take the next moments and make them a special time of us uh, stepping out of ourselves and into the story that brings us together here this morning. There's something that you want to do in us, through us, and for us. It'll be different for each one of us because we're each unique uh, representations of your image, different ways that you want to reflect yourself into our inner spaces and in the world around us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would have permission to do that, that we would be able to set everything else aside and allow your spirit to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it began in the year 2004 as a wrist-mounted 35 millimeter camera. How many people remember 35 millimeter cameras? <laughs> ah, that's us, our generation. How many have never seen a 35 millimeter <laughs> camera? <laughs> but it was invented by a surfer who wanted to take pictures inside the wave. I mean, he, people back, way back in 2004, and I guess for many years, had taken pictures of surfing, but they had to do so from the beach. Couldn't get the camera wet and so on. And so he had discovered a whole new world. Of course, if you're into surfing or have ever watched a surfing movie or film or whatever, you know, when the wave curls and you're all by yourself inside that wave, uh, the view is different from what everybody else sees. And he wanted to share that with people. So he came up with the idea of putting a camera on his wrist. Sort of looked like a corsage at the, at the prom, you know. This camera and the wrist thing. And at the appropriate moment, you would reach down and push the button. His name was Nick Woodman. And uh, he went to Australia, had this brainstorm, came home, pitched the idea to his family and his friends, and started selling, now this is what you'd expect from a surfer, belts with beads and shells on them. Does that sound right? But you have to sell them out of the appropriate thing. A VW van, they literally lived in the van, pulled up, sold these things for like 20 bucks or less, and then got some family money together and came up with this camera. Well, how did it work out for him? In the year 2013, which would be like 10 years later, his company, GoPro, had sold almost a billion dollars worth of stuff. I mean, get that, from shell and bead belts out of a VW van in, 20, oh, in 2004 to 987 or so million dollars, 100 million dollars of, of merchandise not bad for a surfer with a van. His cameras take now and up to four hours of video. His first video camera took 10 seconds. 10 seconds. And that was like, wow, got to have that. Now, four hours of high resolution video. And every single day, 6,000 new GoPro videos are uploaded to YouTube by his customers. The GoPro has a very simple and catchy pitch. It goes like this, three parts. And there you have the man, Nick Woodman, with his GoPro camera. This is your life. Be a hero. Capture and share your world. This is your life. Be a hero. Capture and share your world. You don't have to be rich and famous. You don't have to be sponsored by a major corporation. Just strap on the camera or attach it to your helmet and go do your thing. This is your life. This is your ride up the chairlift. This is your wave that you're going to catch. This is your run on the mountain bike down the hill. This is your thing. You get to be the hero because you're wearing the camera. And then you get to share your world with others. As they say, a picture is worth, what? A thousand words. Now Luke tells us the story of a most unlikely group of heroes who found themselves caught up in the middle of an adventure that was darker even horrifying and more confusing than anything they could have ever imagined. Ask them what they were doing in Jerusalem in the year A.D. 30, April, Passover time, and they would have said, hey, we're just followers of a rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth. This is our life. We all did some things before we met him, but now we follow him and we talk about him and we operate in those gifts that he's given to us to pray for the sick and, and those that are, are mentally uh, deranged by evil spirits and so on. He said, well, that's our new life. We're just doing our life. That's why we're here. This group of people, these unlikely heroes, 
remained true to Jesus throughout the terror of his arrest and his trial and even through the horror of his crucifixion. Luke tells us that even when the 12 disciples were nowhere to be found, one of them had committed suicide, one of them had openly denied Jesus, the 11 that had survived were now all hiding for their lives, there was still a band of men and women who stood their ground some distance from the cross, carefully taking in every detail of what seemed to be the bitter end of Jesus' story. They didn't know it at the time, but God had put them there to be his GoPros. They were doing life. They had no plan to be a hero. Nobody told them that what they were seeing and what they were remembering, we would be talking about even 2,000 years later. But they were there as God's GoPros. Ancient Greek and Roman historians like Luke understood the power of seeing. And they valued eyewitness experience as the gold standard for writing history. We can sometimes look at things that have been written a long ago and, oh, you know, we can find a fault here and, and maybe the style puts us off. And maybe it all seems rather simplistic. But actually, the people of that time, just as people today, took their work very seriously. And they were very determined when they wrote history, as opposed to writing a legend or a fairy tale, that they got it right. And so they had a very high standard for what would qualify as legitimate history. And it was based on eyewitness testimony. In fact, um, Heraclitus, the Greek historian, was quoted many times by various historians as saying these words, eyes are surer witnesses than ears. Eyes are surer witnesses than ears. And the best eyewitness was, quote, someone who as a, was a, as a participant had been closest to the events and whose direct experience enabled him or her to understand and interpret the significance of what he or she had seen. It wasn't enough to have heard about something that happened and then be really good at writing about it, make it all sound very powerful and important. The most important thing was that you were part of that event in some way, a participant. You were caught up in it to some degree. You were living that reality. And then you could take that and put that in print and it would have that cachet, if you will, of being genuine because it came from a real person who was in a real place. I mean, the power of the GoPro is that it goes where you go. I mean, I know I'll go up to the mountain and I'll see people with this camera strapped on top of their, or attached to the top of their helmet. I can promise you they're not pr trying to ace the bunny trail with that thing. <laughs> the whole point is to go somewhere and hopefully not get it knocked off by a branch or something and do something that nobody's going to believe you did until you pull out the video. Oh, you didn't go down that trail. Aha! There, you have fallen into my trap. Watch this video and there it is. <laughs> we are, uh, our news reporters, very carefully, send... Their, uh, their journalists into dangerous places so that what they talk about we have some level of faith in that they're actually seeing what they're saying. And the same thing was true back then. That the best eyewitness was a participant who'd been closest to the events and whose direct experience enabled him or her to understand and interpret the significance of what he or she had seen. And nowhere is this more evident than with this, this little band of unlikely heroes Ordinary human beings who stumbled into the greatest adventure of all time. Now Luke tells us that on Friday evening, what was most likely April 7th, A.D. 30, a wealthy Jewish leader received custody of Jesus' body and buried him in a new rock-cut tomb. Meanwhile, a group of women, part of that group that had been watching the crucifixion and taking in every detail, these women who had followed Jesus, who had made following Jesus their new life, they took great pains to see exactly what happened to the body of their Lord. Luke tells us in Luke 23, verses 52 and 53, speaking of Joseph, this wealthy man, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. And then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The preparation day meant it was the day you got ready for the Sabbath when you didn't do any work. So you did 
double the work on the preparation day, you got all of your all of your food cooked and so on so that you could have that day of rest. Very important little details here, of course. No one else had been laid in this tomb. We think of a tomb as sort of a, for one occupant only. But back in those days, they carved a room, literally carved a room out of, the, out of a rock face, right into the solid rock. And it was a place where the family would bury their dead. And so they had a shelf where the body would be placed and after there, were nothing, there was nothing left but bones, the bones would be put in a box, and the box would be put in a niche. And when archaeologists stumble upon these various tombs, they find dozens and dozens of people have been buried over the years in, this, in one particular tomb. You can see how confusing that would be if there was going to be a conversation in a few days about whether Jesus was or was not there. But this tomb was brand new. It had never been used. It probably had just barely been finished. It was probably meant for Joseph's family. And here it was. Here was Jesus needing to be buried. The hour was short because of Passover, because of Sabbath coming. The body had to be buried very, very quickly. And Joseph said, well, just put him in my tomb. And we read in verse 35, 35, 55, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. God's GoPros. Luke showing us how the women witnessed the burial of Jesus. Uses the word in the original language from which we get our word theater. Now, it, it didn't mean to just catch a glimpse of. It didn't mean to sort of accidentally see something going on. The way you might be standing on a street corner and all of a sudden see a car hit another car. You weren't expecting that, but you sort of looked, you heard a noise, and you saw something. It meant rather to do what you do when you go to the theater, when you go to the movies. You sit there, and they make the room all dark so you can't see anything but the screen, and then all eyes are on the screen. It, to what we do at a sporting event, where we go and we watch the play and watch the replay, and then watch, and all eyes are, are focused on one thing. That's what they were doing. They were there to record in their memories precisely what happened to Jesus. Now, why would they be so concerned? Well, they knew they had to finish this funeral. I can promise you none of them was saying, I got to get this right so that Luke can tell my story 30 years from now. They were there to, with a mission. They knew that this hasty burial would not be appropriate for their master. They would need to finish it according to their customs. So they needed to know exactly where Jesus was buried. They needed to know exactly what was done for him and what was not done for him so that they could come back and finish this funeral. It would be on a Sunday that they would do that because Sabbath was a day of rest. Luke says that after everything was finished, they went home. And they prepared spices and perfumes. Again, all according to their custom of honoring the body of a deceased loved one. Eyes are surer witnesses than ears. And that terrible evening, the eyes which watched Jesus' burial were those of that particular group of women. God's GoPros. How do we know all of this happened? How do we know how Jesus died? How do we know how and where he was buried? Because people saw, and Luke was very careful as he told his story. Same is true in Matthew and Mark and John. They're very careful to only tell what people told them. So now let's fast forward to the day we celebrate. Sunday morning, April 9th, A.D. 30. It was this same group of women, Luke tells us, who faithfully returned as planned on Sunday morning. Mark tells us they got up before the sun rose. Uh, they were at it bright and early. Uh, as soon as Sabbath was over and it was bright enough, light enough for them to even begin to move around, they were going to finish that funeral. Little did they know that that spring morning they would see things that would change their world and your world and my world forever. But let's let them tell their story. Because remember, this is their story that Luke has captured for us. At the crack of dawn on Sunday, we came to the tomb, carrying the burial spices we had prepared. We found the entrance stone rolled back from the tomb, so we walked in. But once inside, we couldn't find the body of the Master Jesus. We were puzzled, wondering what to make of this. Then out of nowhere, it seemed two men 
Light cascading over them stood there. We were awestruck and bowed down in worship. The men said, Why are you looking for the living one in a cemetery? He's not here, but raised up. Remember how he told you when you were still back in Galilee that he had to be handed over to sinners, to be killed on a cross, and in three days rise up? Then we remembered Jesus' words. In order to have a story, you have to live a story. Who wants to go through life living other people's stories? Who wants to go through life watching people do things on TV or in the film movies or whatever, following somebody in social media and be so invested in their life that you forgot that you had one of your own? That's not certainly what God meant for you and for me. Nowhere are we told that we have to throw our life and our identity away and try to just sort of clone ourselves off to someone else. In order to have a story, you have to live a story. And it has to be your story. As you're here this morning and as you come out of whatever your life situation is and come to church this morning and then go back and we, we go into the rest of Easter Sunday and, and uh, into um, the, the spring months, you're living a unique story one that God values above all else in your life. But you have to be able to be willing to live your story. That's what these women did. Uh, they didn't let the circumstances define for them what they would do. They went out of their way to continue to do what they had always done. They were following Jesus, caring for Jesus, providing for him. And here, at the very end of his life, as they understood it, they were going to do that last act of service. Get up early on a Sunday, Go to a graveyard. When they get there, the tomb has been disturbed. That was a common problem in those days. Uh, people would roll away the stone and climb into the tomb and steal the very, very valuable uh, perfumes and spices that had been placed there, maybe even steal the body. Yeah, the problem was so severe that the emperor of Rome himself had to issue a decree saying that anyone who robbed uh, uh, cemeteries and stole the bodies out of tombs would be put to death. I don't know about you, but I don't know whether I would have climbed into that tomb early on a sort of pre-dawn Sunday morning. Imagine, this is a, a cave carved out of the side of a mountain. It's got a little doorway. They didn't have a great big doorway you could just walk through. You had to get down and crawl in and once you got in there, uh, remember, there was no light switch. Uh, they, they didn't have, you know, LEDs sort of gracefully and artfully lighting up the many, many little passageways. Uh, once you were in, and the next person was coming behind you and blocked the doorway, it was lights out, pitch dark. Well, now nobody's supposed to be in there except the person that you came to do the funeral for. And so there you are, it's pitch dark, if the people that moved the stone are still back in there doing some nefarious thing, you're in there with them and you're not getting out. I don't know that I would have jumped into that tomb. It would have smelled of death, only partially masked by the smell of perfumes and spices. But they went in anyway. And they took stock of everything they saw. And then, just when you're in the pitch dark, imagine blazing light. Messengers from heaven asking you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? I mean, no grid for this. They've got no idea what's going on. And still, they hang in there. It doesn't say that they ran in terror. They took in what was said. And they remembered. They remembered what Jesus had said. They had the presence of mind to begin to connect the dots. To begin to weave together the implausibility of a stone rolled away, the utter confusion of not finding a body, of thinking that, well, it must have been his enemies came to do one last terrible thing to him, but then all of a sudden for God to break in and say, no, I'm doing a new thing, just like I promised, and they connected the dots. This was their story. They lived it. They saw it through. Without them, we would have never known. There is no other set of people who were present. This didn't happen in a church service or a temple service. It happened for a group of women 
who dared to live their lives and became heroes. They lived that story and emerged as God's heroes. Live your life, be a hero, capture and share your world. Well, that's what God's GoPros did. We read in the very next verse, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Capture and share your world. Luke tells us the names of three of these women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. While there were other women present, the other Gospels mentioned some other names as well, and Luke says there were a group of women there. Luke specifically tells us of the women from whom he got his story. When, when names are mentioned in the Gospel writings, typically it's because that person was an eyewitness. That person was living their life and was thrust into a place where they had the chance to be one of God's heroes. Maybe by daring to trust Jesus. Maybe by daring to do something never done before. And then came the part of capturing and sharing their world. And they shared that story. Luke tells us that when they gave their report, it didn't go down very well. Verse 11 and 12, but the, the men did not believe the women. Okay, ladies, has that ever happened to you before? <laughs> What's with us guys? Huh? I remember my wife used to joke about taking the car to the back before we had the wonderful mechanic and technician that we have now. Uh, she would say, you take the car. Well, why don't you do it? Because they won't believe me when I say that it's doing such and such. Well, you can imagine. These guys look at these women who are ecstatic, who are excited, who are probably trembling with both fear, joy, a little bit confused. The story is bubbling out. It's coming out faster than, than people can even keep track of the words. They did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Do I have to ask that question, ladies? <laughs> Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Well, we can hardly blame the 11 disciples for failing to embrace this amazing story. Jesus had died on a Roman cross in front of the entire city. He'd been in the grave for three days, which was long enough in their society to say he was truly, truly dead. No hope of resuscitation. What's more, women were considered less than trustworthy as witnesses in that culture. Women were not allowed to give formal testimony in court because it was thought that they would uh, allow their feelings or their emotions to color their testimony. It was a man's world. Uh, it was very much a sexist world in that sense. And so for women to have a story, to be the ones who brought the, new, the news that God had raised Jesus from the dead uh, would not necessarily have gone well with the guys in any event. But God had entrusted the news that Jesus was raised from the dead to that brave and observant group of women disciples. They, not Peter, were the ones who had seen Jesus die. They, not the 11 disciples, were the ones who had seen where and how he was buried. They alone were the ones who had found his tomb empty. And they were the ones who remembered his promise that after three days he would rise again. What I love about this story is one thing that isn't said, but is obviously clear. They didn't back down. They didn't abandon their story. They didn't change their story to accommodate the doubts of the disciples. You know, they didn't go, oh, well, you know, yeah, maybe we were a little, you know, oh, no, maybe, maybe it wasn't quite like that. And, oh, you're probably right. They stood their ground. You see, live your life. Be a hero. Capture and share your world. You share what God did for you. If other people don't get it, if it doesn't, isn't plausible to them, if it doesn't seem possible, well, that's for them to figure out. But that doesn't mean that you back down from what you saw and what you experienced. And they stood there. They did not back down. A little later in Luke, 
we read about two disciples who were on the road talking unbeknownst to Jesus. And they said, well, you know, Jesus died and, and he was put in a tomb and, and it, we'd hoped he would be the one that would save us and save Israel. What's more, there have been some women who went and said the tomb was empty and, you know, it's kind of, we're not quite sure what to do with what they had to say. They didn't back down. This was their story. They were there. Eyes are surer witnesses than ears. Early Christian writers tell us that over the next decades, these men and women traveled the world as witnesses of what they had seen Jesus say and do. The idea of being a witness is very important. When you read Luke's next volume, Acts, the first thing, the last thing Jesus says, and there it is in chapter 1, is Jesus looks at his followers and says, you will be my witnesses. What did he mean? You're going to go tell the story that you've captured. He's just finished telling us that for 40 days he would appear with his disciples and they would eat and drink with him and know that he was physically alive. And he said, now you need to go out and tell them, yes, God conquered death. How do you know? Because I saw him. I sat with Jesus. I ate and drank with him. Eyes are sure witnesses than ears. God's story isn't finished. And he's not finished making heroes that will capture and share the good news of what it means to belong to God's family. You and I are called to be God's GoPros. There may be a place in your life and in your world where death needs to give way to the good news that Jesus has conquered sin and death. If you think about it, when those women went to that tomb, they were on a mission to finish a tragedy, to put the final touches on a failure. Isn't there, aren't, those, aren't there situations sometimes in our lives like that where something has gone wrong, uh, someone is, is, we've lost someone, we've lost a relationship, we haven't seen our parenting plan work out the way we hoped it would, our career hit a dead end, whatever the case might be, We've maybe wanted to overcome some inner challenges or some inner problems. And when we've tried, we've gotten knocked down. Yes, I want to be that hero. I want to be that person that accomplishes what I was meant to be. I want to overcome this, this particular uh, problem in my life. I want to see myself the way God sees me. I want all that to happen, but every time I try, somebody just smacks me down. Who do you think you are anyway? You can't do that. You may have voices in your head. We probably all do of something that a parent or some other adult said when you were just a kid and whatever they meant by it they had no idea perhaps that you would still be thinking that 10 20 or 30 years later and that it is part of the definition of who, who you are and sometimes we just come to those things and figure well better to finish the funeral and move on roll a stone over it put that last bit of investment have some closure and just say that part of my being, that part of my life, that hope, that dream is dead forever and a piece of me dies with it. That's what was happening for those ladies. When they walked into that, into that graveyard, they were finishing up the work of being a follower of Jesus. It was, they were taking the last 30 or 40 steps of following Jesus. They fully intended, when they finished the funeral, they would start a new, sadder life thereafter their lives would be defined by what if or if only is there a place in your life that might have the little words if only written over it what these women and their story tells us is that God has a bigger plan and you're going to find it may be today it may be over the next months or weeks or, or even hours it may be in a conversation. It may be when you're all by yourself. You're going to find God challenging you to go back one more time. Back to that cemetery. I don't want to go back there. I don't want to go unearth that thing that happened 10, 20 years ago. I don't want to dig up that thing. I'm covering it up. I've had that funeral. I don't want to go there again. And God will keep saying to you, you'll never be complete. You'll never be whole. You'll never be truly alive. This is your life. I want to give you the life that 
I meant for you to have. But we've got to, first of all, go back and check out that place one more time. What would you do if you found the stone had been moved? Would you go back in? Would you go back one more time to see if things are just the way they always were? Or whether God had done something new? It's one of the hardest things we ever do. One of the hardest things we ever do is to perhaps dare to trust a person who has hurt us in the past and who now perhaps maybe, maybe sends us a card or calls on the phone or we see them at a family event and they say, you know, I'm sorry for what I've done and I'd like to have a relationship again. Is that the stone moving or is it a trap? Am I going to step into that place and they're going to roll the stone over and ha ha, I got you. Or could God be doing a new thing? I can't answer that for you. I've got my own stones to move. That's your challenge. You see, God wants you to be the hero in that place. To roll back the darkness and to let his light shine in. So we can be like those ladies going to that tomb. We each have our own place where we're going to go and we're going to have to face the choice. Am I going to live my old life or am I going to embrace a new life God has for me? If I embrace a new life, I've got to be a hero. I've got to be willing to let things get out of my control. I've got to be willing for God to tell me some new things. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? What are you doing in a cemetery? He's not here. He's alive. And when God has touched you, and when that healing has come, you will find that you will have an opportunity to capture and share your world. You see, we're God's GoPros. We're God's Gospels. Believe it or not, look around. You're looking at several hundred Gospels. The Gospel according to Sue. The Gospel according to Art and Judy. The Gospel according to Sean. The God. We are the Gospel. If people are going to discover Jesus, remember, eyes are sure witnesses than words. We have all the words and they're wonderful, and they affirm everything that God did for us. But you know what's going to change a life? God through you is going to change a life. Your act of forgiveness is going to break down a stronghold. Your trust in the middle of perhaps a diagnosis or perhaps a loss, your trust in God is going to shine through. How many of you, even in a place that may be very hostile to any kind of religious talk at all, just because you have been a follower of Jesus, have found that when nobody else was around, maybe at the end of the workday, maybe even somebody that you didn't even get along with came by and said, I know that you pray. Would you pray for my, for my mother-in-law? Or would you pray for my son? How many has that happened for? It happens all the time. Because we're God's GoPros. He uploads us, our stories, into the spiritual YouTube, if you will. As we share, that's something that God's going to do with you. He's already doing it, right on track, just as he did with these amazing people who told us the story that brings us together today. So a couple of things for you to think about as we prepare for the Lord's table, as we partake of the bread and the cup here this morning, as we celebrate Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. Is there a stone to be moved? Somewhere in the story of your life, perhaps from long ago, perhaps something that's happening right now, is there a place where God's new life and his love and his power and his forgiveness and his cleanness and goodness and purity is going to displace all of the junk that would clutter our lives and clutter our world? Will you dare to be a hero? And once you have, and if that has happened for you, are you willing to capture and share the good news that Jesus is alive? Let's bow our heads together. I'm going to ask that our uh, elders come down at this time. We partake once a month of the, uh, the bread and the cup in the Lord's Supper. And we invite all of you to be part of that. If Jesus is your Lord, uh, it may be uh, something that, that will carry a special meaning for you this morning in that you may be already sensing God is saying, uh, there's a stone to be moved. It doesn't matter whether other people get it. It doesn't matter whether other people are all on board. 
You're going to take the first step. Trust me. I'm already there. I've already touched that place with life. You're going to go back looking for the same old death and you're going to find that the tomb is empty. Maybe that you're on the other end of that process and you've seen God bless and now you're sensing somehow I'm going to share this. Don't know how. Don't worry. You don't have to figure that out. It'll come up. People will ask. You'll find yourself in situations where the only way you can be an honest and true and friendly person is to share your world. Go for it. Be God's GoPro.